I think we can get started. And if somebody's joining in late, I'm sure uh, Tori will take care of that. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, we are so excited to, uh, that you joined us today. My name is Anelia Tichkova. Um, and uh, I'm the program manager for school and community engagement at Oakville Green Conservation Association. We also have Tori Kenny, who is our volunteer and fundraising coordinator. Um, just a couple of words about our organization and uh, the, the program. Um, so Oakville Green is a grassroots environmental organization and we aim to reconnect people to the natural environment um, in their neighborhoods, but also across the community um, and just to increase their awareness of the importance of nature um, and move them to action um, so we can protect and enhance this natural environment. Um, we engage residents through various programs um, such as tree planting, pollinator garden stewardship, invasive species removal, nature and forest walks, and uh, educational presentations and workshops and actually so much more. Uh, the Green Tea virtual meetings are part of our uh, Green Connections program for adults 55 plus. Um, and this program is aimed to engage uh, residents in nature themed activities and events to reduce social isolation um, and build community togetherness. Uh, we strongly believe that exposure to nature, even virtually, brings uh, so much uh, positive experience, um, emotions, positive emotions, and overall um, improves uh, psychological and physical well being. Uh, so, we welcome participation from various multicultural groups. And we would like with the green tea to um, offer a forum for discussion, for sharing ideas and for new experiences and learning. So um, today's theme is Magnificent Monarchs, a wonderful topic. And we hope that um, uh, this chat will brighten up um, our day. It's a little bit of a gloomy day here in, uh, in Oakville, Ontario. Um, but uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Oakville butterfly conservationist, Margaret Larson, who is a recipient of uh, 2017 Ontario Senior Achievement Award in 2017 Ontario Horticultural Society District 6 Award uh, for her efforts in monarch butterflies conservation. Uh, she's, she's done a lot. She's very passionate about monarch butterflies. And thank you so much, Margaret, for joining us today. Um, feel free, if you feel comfortable, to put your comments or questions in the chat box. Tori will make sure that she keeps track of that or just save your questions uh, at the end. Uh, we will leave some time for discussion and for sharing ideas. And um, I, a lot, it seems like the milkweed is growing at somewhere, not in my backyard yet, but <laughs> it would be fun. It would be fun to, to have some time uh, to chat after. So I will share my screen. I will share the screen and I'll just give the word to Margaret. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you once again. Very okay. excited. Okay, I'm just waiting for the uh, first slide to come up and uh, then I'll get right into the discussion of monarchs. So Anelia is going to put the slide in in a minute. All right, just a second. And in the meantime, I'll tell you that I haven't always been a monarch butterfly enthusiast. I actually started about 16 or 17 years ago. I was uh, with Oakville Horticultural Society then, and one of the members, Merlene Hall, was raising monarchs. And we were at our annual show at uh, Hopedale Mall. And I just said, I got to do that. Can I have some caterpillars, Merlene? And she said, sure. She, she was such a sharing person. And I always like to share too. So what's happened over the past 17 years is I've just shared my experience and shared my um, dedication and invited people to join with me. 
So uh, they have. Um, uh, it's just been amazing. So whatever I've done is because of all of the people who have helped me with, um, with my work with monarchs. I didn't even consider myself passionate. I just thought that it was a nice thing to do. You know, like Martha Stewart says, uh, it's a good thing. So um, this warning is really true. Um, you know, uh, I love to talk about monarchs. And uh, fortunately, now there's a lot of other people that share this interest and are even growing milkweed in their um, yard. So uh, I'll get the next slide now, Anelia. All right. And uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation was originally called Monarchs and Milkweed, but Magnificent Monarchs is so much better because it really, really does share, it states our real enthusiasm for how really magnificent they are. And if you look at this guy, some of, some of my viewers today are going to, this is going to be repetitious for them, but some is going to be new material too. And the reason I put this guy on is he is a male and you can tell because on his bottom wings, he's got the two little dots that are his scent glands to try. I, I think of it as some um, old spice lotion you know, the men used to put Old Spice on to attract females. And this is what the male monarch does. And of course, it's resting on some milkweed. And it looks as if it, mm, no, I think it's common milkweed, but there's over 110 kinds of milkweed. So I don't know all 110. I'm most familiar with the four or five that grow locally in Ontario. And uh, so monarchs have many en enemies, uh, egg eaters, caterpillar eaters, butterfly eaters, and humans. And unfortunately, it's the humans that are the really, really dangerous ones because they used to just think of uh, caterpillars would eat the crop or milkweed would get into the fields. And humans have been using herbicides and pesticides for so many years, they've been, taking over the, uh, the um, habitats, especially in California. This year in California, they only had 1,000 monarchs. That's how many monarchs. Out of the millions that used to be in the Western monarch population, which is the other side of the Rockies, there used to be millions of monarchs. And, uh, now there's only 1,000. I mean, the, the devastation of the um, human habitat is overwhelming, as well as the devastation to the monarch butterfly. So the um, four common milkweed types that I'm going to talk about are common milkweed, which of course is people say it's invasive, but I like to say it's assertive. And because it's a nicer word than aggressive or invasive, it does so, sort of have a tendency to take over because it likes any type of soil and it'll grow just about anywhere. But if, if you uh, think of it as a little bit assertive, I've grown it in my garden. I know uh, a bunch of people are growing it in their gardens and it's really, really easy to pull out. Uh, mind you, it'll come back the next year, but then you can just pull it out again. So um, it's, it's not that difficult to maintain and it is one of the monarch's favorite milkweeds. Just waiting for the next slide and uh, we'll get that up there soon. There we go. So swamp milkweed, the town of Oakville has gone really, really, I'm not going to say crazy, but they're doing a fantastic job with swamp milkweed. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need a damp habitat, as even though it is called swamp milkweed. Um, they've got it down at the bottom of uh, Bronte um, Marina, 
Uh, they've got it in down at the bottom of Kerr Street where they put in that, that new uh, parkette and really glamorized it. So it is uh, an easy one to grow and uh, you can use it as a potted plant in your uh, garden or you can just plant it in your garden. Uh, butterfly weed. Now, People again, the word weed gets to people and they say, well, we got to pull it out. So now they're calling it butterfly milkweed to sort of let people that are in the know that it is a milkweed. It's one of the few milkweeds that does not have the sap in it. Uh, most milkweed, of course, it's called milkweed because of the milky substance that is in the stems and the leaves and everything. And this one is a very beautiful one and it's very self-contained and it doesn't have a wild spreading habit. So it's a, another great one for your garden. And tropical milkweed. And I know some people say, oh, it's tropical. Yes, but it, uh, it's beautiful. The monarchs really, really love it. Uh, Ted Ruddy, who lives down at the bottom of third line on water's edge, He's right on the lake and he plants tropical milkweed and the monarchs, they just, when they're heading south, they stop at his place for lunch, breakfast, dinner, whatever. He usually has about 40 or 50 tropical milkweed plants growing. He saves all the seeds and he gives it out to um, friends and neighbors that walk by. He's, he's even got a sign that, that uh, with an arrow saying butterflies here. So I don't know if that's for the humans or so that the butterflies will know where to stop in for lunch. And okay, so this is a monarch laying an egg. You can see that it uh, bends its um, abdomen under uh, the leaf onto the plant. And um, of course it's a female and uh, it's a good looking monarch. Once monarchs start to get old, they only live for about three to four weeks. The, uh, the summer monarchs live for three to four weeks. So if you see a monarch that's all sort of dull and faded, it's lost a lot of it, its scales. But this one looks like a fresh one that um, would be doing good. Now, Marie Decker just told me that her milkweed is up about 18 inches. I have another friend and her milkweed is up about six inches, but these are in very Southern sunny locations. Um, mostly the milkweed is starting to uh, grow when your lilacs are out. So when the lilacs are in bloom, this is when you can really start looking for monarchs and especially for monarch eggs. Last year, it was June the 1st. I found my first egg on June the 1st when the lilacs were blooming. Monarch laying an egg, this is on common milkweed and uh, she's gonna, she's laying the eggs right in the flower buds, which is a bit unusual because usually they like to lay them underneath the leaf so that they're a little bit protected from weather and also are not a visual. Because remember in the enemies, ants love to eat fresh eggs. Um, the blue uh, wasp loves to eat little tiny caterpillars, takes them home to its babies. So mostly uh, caterpillars of monarchs need to be hidden, but this egg is being put right in amongst the flowers. And doing it again, and you can see that egg there very, very clearly, and uh, she's looking good. Now, this is a little video I got from Dodo, and it's gonna show you the uh, bit of the life cycle of the Monarch, much better than I can ever explain.
they're so cute when they're little, just like baby puppies or baby kittens. They're just so sweet. But you know what? They're so small, you can't even, uh, you can hardly see them. I have about 10 um, magnifying glasses that people have given me to uh, help. And yes, they do eat lots of leaves. And actually, it's a thousand times bigger. Uh, Dodo got it wrong there. And watch it split. It's absolutely amazing to see it split. And it only takes about two minutes for it to emerge. It's, and this is almost um, not a time lapse. It does it so quickly. And then it, this is the chrysalis, of course. And it does this little dance as it's hardening its chrysalis. And uh, it's going to turn black. And the first time my chrysalis turned black, I thought I'd killed it. And because I didn't have a lot of knowledge back then, and um, it's going to drop out and stretch its new wings. And um, not trying to see if this is a male or female. Oh, it's a female. So it said, now he's a beautiful butterfly, but they got it wrong again. And um, like I said, the summer butterflies only last about uh, three to four weeks. So you have to sort of get it while it's there. Mind you, it's all summer. So you're seeing other ones, of course. Okay, now this is a uh, common milkweed. And this, of course, the size of the egg is about the size of a grain of salt. So sometimes there's some other things like aphids. Sometimes I, I say, is that an aphid or is that an egg? And then if it starts walking, I know it's an aphid. And you can see how hairy the clumps are. And out of power, don't shut that. Well, uh, we can um, see that there's a lot of little hairs on the milkweed. And this is actually what the teeny tiny caterpillar eats first because the leaf is just too much for it. Uh, this is the shape of it. Uh, I call it like a Canadian toque that uh, people wear. And you can see the ribs and everything. And this is the little black head of the cat. Uh, we call them cats or babies. It's just a friendly sort of name to be calling them. And... Um, We'll go to the next one. Here it is again, hatching out, walking out. Um, caterpillars, because they are an insect, only have six legs, but um, it, it will look as if it has more legs, but they're called prolegs. They're just sort of helpful appendages. The actual caterpillar only has six. And now the caterpillar is going to turn around and eat its eggshell before it got to this point, because the eggshell is actually full of nutrients and it, so it eats its eggshell. And if you ever see these markings on a milkweed leaf, it's obviously the cat has been doing them. These are very, very typical of a caterpillar eating. Okay, a little bit bigger, the, um, Caterpillar morphs five times. That It's got an exoskeleton. So the only way that it can get bigger is to get rid of its old skeleton and, have a, and walk out of its old skeleton. And there's the new skeleton already forming. So again, you can see uh, slipping out of its skin, walking right out and then turning around and again, eating its skin because the skin is full of nutrients. And uh, monarch caterpillars don't like to waste anything. Okay, the fifth instar is the caterpillar when it's at its biggest, it's about two and a half inches long and it's on some tropical milkweed and it's just having its last meal. And then it's going to lay down a little silken pad and it's going to become a chrysalis. And of course, a moth has a cocoon, a butterfly has a chrysalis.
And you can see uh, the colors, just in case you haven't been paying too much attention. They're black, yellow, and white. And this guy is getting ready again to, they call it jang. It makes a J uh, when it's getting ready to hang. And um, we'll go to the next slide. And here it is, Jane. And it, um, the webbing that it puts there has to be able to survive storm and rain and wind. So it's a very strong material, whatever it is. And you're going to see, I think in the next slide that the antenna are going to, the J is going to become straight and the antenna are going to, get all corkscrewed like. Nope, not yet, but you can see um, the white silk very clearly there that it's um, attached to. And did you notice all of the stems there? He's eaten most of the stems on that particular milkweed, all the leaves, and they can eat a lot. So here it is shedding its final, final skin like we saw in the dodo uh, little movie. One of the things that I wanted to tell you, if you're going to raise monarchs, and I'm going to tell you why it's really important to actually raise them now. Um, first, first of all, you need a really good source of milkweed. I remember one night I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and my butter, my caterpillars had no food and I didn't have any in the fridge. And I had to get into the car at three o'clock in the morning in my pajamas and go to a, a site that I know where there's milkweed, grab some milkweed to bring it home to my babies. Now, people do ask me, why don't you just leave the caterpillars alone, the eggs alone? Why do you put them out? Why do you bring them in and raise them inside? And isn't that sort of going in against nature? Well, no, it's not really because I'm not treating them any different. They're in the same basic environment as they would be outside. Some people even use screen porches so that they are totally outside. But I've gone to a site where I knew there were eggs and there's four eggs and I come back in the afternoon and the eggs are gone. The ants, the spiders, the earwigs, they've all eaten the monarchs. And a hundred years ago, the monarch butterfly was so profuse that when it did its migration to Mexico, the cloud of monarchs was so many that it would actually darken the sky. It would almost be like nighttime because the monarch butterfly was so prolific. Now, if we even see um, a flock or a kaleidoscope of uh, even 40 or 50 butterflies all flying at the same time, we're happy. So in a hundred years, they've gone from billions and billions down to millions. This is the gold and green chrysalis. And about four years ago, a 15 year old boy figured out how to tell whether this was going to be a male or a female. I sort of know, but it's sort of difficult to explain. And um, so I'm not gonna do it. And the other thing about this is you see the band of gold at the top and you see that there's also some gold dots down below. Um, Monarch, uh, he called it, um, I just forgot the word for people who do insects. But anyway, they, nobody knows why there's the gold band and why they're the gold dots. So something um, more to find out about monarch butterflies. So um, you can see this uh, chrysalis is just becoming sort of grayish. So the butterfly, until this happened, what was inside the chrysalis was actually a bunch of green glue, goo. This uh, 
process is called complete metamorphosis because now it's changing into an absolutely different looking species. The one thing I wanted to mention here was in, um, in 1600s, in the 1600s, a lady by the name of Maria Marion, she started studying butterflies and moths and things at the age of 13. And back then, people didn't realize that butterflies came from caterpillars. They believed in something called spontaneous generation, that things just appeared through the will of God or something. And quite often, they would kill what they called worms because they thought they were worms and they didn't realize that they were part of a life cycle. So Maria was in the 1600s, she was the one that figured out that there's a process in uh, evolution. And it was actually her books that got, I'm going to say this wrong, Linnaeus, uh, he, he's a uh, referred to as sort of the father of um, binomial nomenclature, but it was Maria's books that helped him figure it out. And you can see in this uh, picture, the color changes and almost ready to emerge. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? And the next one is in two minutes. Uh, that's all it takes to go from chrysalis to butterfly but it has to it's like drying sheets outside you have to leave the sheets hang for three or four hours before the sheets will get dry and this is like a monarch butterfly it has to dry its wings for about three to four hours and otherwise it's easy target for a bird or something else that might want to eat it or prey on it Okay, this is uh, since 1994, they've been keeping track. This is a graph from Monarch Watch and Monarch Watch was organized in 1994 by Chip Taylor and Lincoln Brower, uh, two guys down in, I think it's um, Michigan. Anyway, you can see in um, 94, 95, I guess 96, the Monarch population was huge. And it's just come down and come down, gone back up, come down. So again, this is why we want to plant lots of milkweed and also why we want to maybe even bring some eggs or caterpillars in to save them from being eaten. Now, about 10 years ago, Oakville Green had a program and they showed us how to make milkweed seed mud balls. That was part of their their, their thing at the time was to get the milkweed seed out there. Well, I took it a bit of a step further and I got all sorts of people involved. And in the past few years, many, many friends, we have dispersed over 52,000 milkweed seed balls around Oakville, even further north in cottages and stuff like that. So unfortunately last year, I wasn't able to get the milkweed seed out because of COVID, but I sure have lots of milkweed seed that I'm uh, gonna just try and disperse. This is a perfect time of year to be planting milkweed or to be dispersing the seed all over Oakville or cottage country or wherever. So again, reasons for decline in population, uh, climate change, illegal logging in Mexico, um, loss of habitat. Now, flowers that monarchs like to nectar at. Um, a lot of these you'll know, uh, of course, they like all the milkweeds and uh, there's like maybe, a hundred or so actual flowers that monarchs like to nectar at. Tithonia, also called Mexican sunflower. And again, it is an annual up here and you can see it's proboscis there. Now, this is really, really interesting because we used to always think that they sip the nectar like a, 
like their proboscis was a straw. It's not a straw. It's like trees. It's um, the term just went out of my head again. Uh, hang on, I'm looking it up. Um, wouldn't you know it? I didn't write it down because I thought I would remember. It's, it's like a paper towel siphoning up a spill. And uh, I'll think of the name and tell it to you later. But anyway, it is not a straw. Uh, roosting, okay, so at night monarchs uh, don't fly at night. They don't have the sun, they don't have the heat. So they find a tree and a bunch of buddies come along and they uh, stay there for the night. And then in the morning, about two years ago, they were roosting on um, some trees in Oakville on Morden Road behind St. James School. And nobody told me about it till the next day. And I went the next day to look at sunset. No, I couldn't, I've, I have never, even though I've been working with monarchs for 15 years, I have never seen a roost, but there's still hope. And here's 20 or more, there's three or four reasons why they roost. They roost if the weather's bad, like uh, if we're having a thunderstorm or anything. They roost uh, because it's too cold to fly. They roost because it's nighttime. And down in Mexico, they roost for just about all of the above reasons. But in Mexico, of course, and that's one of the reasons why the North American monarch butterfly is so uh, amazing is th these guys fly 20 or 30 or more miles a day, takes them a month and a half to two months to get to Mexico. And it was our Canadian fellow from uh, Mississauga, Fred, 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 just went out. Okay, it'll come back. And anyway, he and his wife uh, spent years and years and years trying to find out where um, the monarch butterfly went. And then in 1976, they finally found that it went to Mexico for the winter. And a lot, a lot of guys roosting here. And uh, I didn't take this picture. I wish I had taken this picture. I think it is so great. Uh, the monarch's favorite color is orange. The next favorite color is blue. The next favorite color is yellow. The monarch's last favorite color is red. So if you're planting for the monarch, plant a lot of orange. And, but see this, uh, he's, he, he's on red, but he still would have preferred orange. And I just remembered Fred's last name, it's Fred Urquhart. If you ever get a chance to go to Dundas, there's a little pollinator garden in Dundas called the Urquhart Garden and uh, named after Fred Urquhart. So, uh, Group of monarchs is called uh, like a herd of cows. No, it's a flight of butterflies, a flutter, a kaleidoscope, a wing, or even a rainbow. These are all uh, words to describe them when you see them flying in a flock. And uh, unfortunately, that's not my hand either, but I do have some nice pictures of people's hands. And uh, I think that's just about the end of the slideshow. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Margaret. You're I've, welcome. Ne I've never enjoyed my uh, cup of green tea more than this morning, <laughs> listening to, you, <laughs> to your inspiring stories. Um, Yes, monarch butterflies are very amazing creatures, really fascinating. And there is so much we can learn from nature um, and uh, so many things that we don't know. So it, it, it is great to, to be able to observe them and really to, to put so much effort in, in conservation for these uh, uh, magnificent uh, butterflies. Um, yeah. So I do grow myself um, the common um, milkweed, um, 
the, the, the orange, the butterfly wheat and the swamp milkweed. Mm -hmm. uh, from my experience, I can tell that the swamp milkweed is just a powerhouse for not huh. just the monarchs, but absolutely for all uh, for so many insects and pollinators that it is it is and it, it it is growing as you mentioned not necessarily in very moist moist conditions so i highly recommend this plant i'm gonna uh, go to tori and see if there are any comments or questions in the chat first and then we can see if somebody else uh, have other questions for margaret okay uh, peter and margaret asked uh, if you can tell us the, the lifespan difference between uh, the butterflies that migrate here and the ones that are born here. Okay, the um, summer butterflies only last three to four weeks. The ones that are born in the fall, in September-ish, they're going to live for about nine, eight to nine months because they have to spend a month and a half to two months getting to Mexico. Then they spend, uh, they usually get to uh, Mexico around November the 1st. Um, the Mexican people have a big celebration because they used to think of it as their ancestors coming back to visit them. And so then they uh, roost in the, um, there's about, ah, oh, this was something interesting. They just found a new roosting area two years ago in Mexico. Until then, there was only about 15 roosting areas, and now they've found another one. But the monarchs that go to Mexico uh, in the end of February, uh, it starts warming up in Mexico and they start heading back north. So um, we were very concerned this year about the milkweed in Texas because of that big Texas freeze that they had just about when the monarch should be uh, arriving there. But uh, some areas the, the milkweed was hit really hard, other areas it wasn't. So those monarchs la live about anywhere from seven to eight to nine months. One, one monarch actually made it all the way back to Canada and they could tell because of the tag that uh, some people tag monarchs and uh, they found that the tag was from Toronto by um, Don Davis, who's another monarch butterfly enthusiast. Yay. Sorry, uh, are, do we have any other questions? There's nothing in the chat, but oh, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, so the, there is nothing, no more, no questions in the chat, but if anyone has any that they want to ask in the chat or uh, unmute themselves and ask a question. Uh, Tori? Yes, go ahead. It, it, it's Ruth, and I'm wondering if Margaret was looking for the word osmosis. Is that how they take up the nectar or is there a different word? There's a different word, it's, it's pretty close. And I can see the trees doing it because of course trees can't sip up sap right to the top. And it's, um, it, it'll come to me as soon as this uh, meeting is over. That's what happens, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to senior moments, Margaret. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh. Wicking, no. Wicking. <laughs> not wicking but but that's the way the way wicking works it's that's ah. actually the, the way but it's not the scientific term but whoever said wicking has got the right idea anybody got a computer on the side and can check it i think i've got it oh by the way um in uh 2018 i didn't have anything to do uh I, it was the winter I, there's nothing to do so i wrote, wrote a series of little booklets just to have something to do and this is where i learned a lot of what i've just shared to you uh, so i wrote monarch life cycle i wrote monarchs raising them so if anybody has some questions about raising them now's the time they're really really easy to raise i see some of our very famous raisers there's uh, Yvonne and David May here, there's Dorothy Dennison. They've all been ra raising monarchs for years now. Here's monarchs and milkweed and tells you that there's about 110 different types of milkweed. Uh, monarchs and migration and uh, monarchs and gardens. So if ever you're really interested in something, sit down and write a little book because then you have to research it really well. 
right. Thank you, Margaret. I I did see a question if the chrysalis form on a milkweed plant or on uh, other plants as well. I've seen them form on, on different plants. They're actually trying to hide, but what is your experience, Margaret? Yeah, I have never, I have rarely found a chrysalis because they're so well hidden and never on a milkweed. I found one over my doorway one day when I'm going out. I found them on the side of a, um, on the side of a container plant. And, uh, but they, they usually really like to hide. Yes, I, I've, I've seen them on the, on the uh, bricks on the wall. And you mm -hmm. know that my, it's uh, it's a lot of fun for for my kids to really try to find them um, and just <laughs> they've been waiting you know sometimes yeah. for like hours just to to wait when it's time for <laughs> to yeah to have. It's, um, it's sort of like an Easter egg hunt yeah exactly yeah. Um, there is also a comment um, uh, from Maria. Um, and she's uh, interested in um, uh, helping out to disperse the, the, the seed balls. Um, mm. So we can definitely chat further about that. I know Margaret okay. dropped off some um, seed balls at uh, my place as well. Uh, so we would love to, as soon as things open up a little bit, or we can do like a contactless drop off of mm. the seed balls. Uh, so they can go to the right place and, and you know, hopefully. And, <laughs> and I've got lots of swamp milkweed as well, since you said that it's a good grower in your garden. I, I have lots and lots of swamp milkweed. Dorothy, are you trying to say something? I was going to say I found a chrysalis hanging from my eaves trough in my house one day. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Did you actually see the butterfly emerge? No, the next day I went out to check on it and it was gone. So oh, I don't know like if the wind knocked it off or what. I don't know what happened. Was it green or black when you saw it? It was green. Oh, so something got it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Margaret, um, someone's asking, uh, uh, where can we get your booklets? Uh, from me. I, I, I only, I only uh, published a few and uh, you can get my phone number if you want. Uh, I don't mind if you give it out or if I give it out now. Just give me a call and we can do that contactless uh, uh, pickup, you know, curbside pickup. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, can I just say something here? Uh, two or three years ago, we went to one of the mud ball uh, what should I say? Oh. Seminars out at the senior center, and a lot of them home with us. And you talked about them traveling around. While well, our granddaughters that live out in Acton have a grandpa and grandma up in Magnetowan. Now I don't know whether they would grow in Magnetowan or not, but they took quite a few of those seed balls with them to see what they could do way up there. I haven't heard what happened, but it was just interesting that the children were so became so interested in spreading these wherever they could. So well. If, if that's on a latitude with Algonquin Park, I know there is some milkweed up in Algonquin Park. Not, not that much, but um, with climate change now as well, you know, it's, it's a, the uh, summer line is getting a little bit further north, but it's, it's always worth a try. This, this is a funny story. Dor Dorothy and I, we were, she was driving. Now just remember, she was driving. So she was not the distracted driver. <laughs> we're, we're, we're driving around uh, up a country road and I'm tossing the, the uh, milkweed balls out the uh, side of the window. And I, I just about hit the car behind me one time because it sort of flipped back. But uh, <laughs> any, anyway, it was, it was just a sort of a th fun thing to do. Yep. I just wanted also to mention that um, I haven't observed uh, a rooster as, um, you know, going back to Margaret's talk, but um, if you ever have a chance, if things open up, if you have the opportunity to visit a Peely Point um, towards the end of the summer, depending on the weather, but um, mm -hmm. That one year I was at the beginning of October and it was absolutely magnificent. The, mm -hmm. uh, the number of monarchs that are in the sky, 
um, they, it seems that it is one of their gathering spots before they migrate south. Uh, so it was just beautiful to actually observe. Uh, it's it's amazing, you know, just to see them all gathering up and and trying to find these last uh, bites. You know, they're just looking for the golden rods and for the for the late pollinator plant. So it's it's really really beautiful to to observe. Yeah, and if you can't get as quite as far as Peely Point, Point Peely, you can go to Long Point. Uh, Long Point's about half of the out of the way, and um, or else um, come down to the to Ted Ruddy's place. He loves having people walk by. Again, it's the bottom of Third Line and Water's Edge Road, and if it's a bright sunny day in September, you'll see 20, 30, 40 monarchs at a time all. Uh, feasting on his uh, tropical milkweed. And he loves the company, so don't, don't be nervous. Yes, I've passed by and I, 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 know I have seats. I have seats from him as well, so. Oh, good, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You mentioned the Urquhart Garden down in Dundas, and that's a great place to go to. It's not very big, it's free, you can wander around there, and it's, mm -hmm. it's one of our go-to places in the summer because every time you go, not only monarchs, but I was gonna say gazillions of butterflies and bugs and beetles and things you can just right. stand and observe for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the lady who helped establish that park, she is such a nature person. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Joanne something or other, and not something or other, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that she, was not her name tag. <laughs> She, she helped get that started and uh, she, she does uh, turtle watch in Dundas and she gets uh, speakers to come, especially in the springtime, which we couldn't do this past year, but one time we were looking for uh, spiders and one time we were looking for butterflies and uh, these, are, these are people who really know it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Margaret, we have a question about uh, Ted's last name, the... Um... Ruddy, R-U-D-D-Y, -R Ted Ruddy. Thank you. Yep. All right, so if I have your permission, Margaret, I can share your phone number. I can do, I can do it right now if people right. want to get a paper and pencil. 905. I see somebody dashing for a paper and pencil. So um, I'm just going to see what else I had on my list that I didn't get to mention while she's grabbing her paper. Uh, oh, here's one. Charlotte Hill, in 1874, she was living in uh, Colorado, and she was a fossil collector. I actually think they made a movie about her, but it was a sort of a weird movie. But she found a butterfly fossil, which is rare, rare, rare. Her butterfly fossil is called number one, and it's stored at Harvard University because that was the first butterfly fossil ever found. Also, butterflies have been around for 200 million years. So, um, and they've found some in the amber fields, They've also found a lot of moth fossils in the amber fields, and uh, but rarely because they're such delicate things that it's uh, difficult to get a good fossil of any sort. So anyway, the uh, phone number is 905-827-6623. And I'll say it one more time, 905-827-6623. 2-3. Dorothy, you didn't write it down. I also typed it in the chat. <laughs> it's up here. It's in my head. Okay. <laughs> Margaret, I have another question for you um, uh, in about the tropical milkweed. Mm -hmm. um, we have not uh, planted tropical milkweed and, um, in our gardens. And we were just, I'm just wondering, um, I know it's a great uh, food source for the, <laughs> for the monarchs. Would, they, would that be a, um, their choice for laying their eggs? And would the cat oh, yeah. actually? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. 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 Um, it, it depends on the female butterfly. I have had common milkweed and tropical milkweed side by side. Some have chosen the common milkweed. Some have chosen the tropical milkweed. It's sort of people, some people prefer uh, potato chips. Some people prefer chocolate. You, you know, it's, it sort of really depends on the individual female. But you gotta, you gotta bring those eggs in uh, before the, uh, the earwigs and the uh, spiders and the ants get the eggs. You gotta bring them in. I know Yvonne and Dave, uh, th sometimes they get overwhelmed. They, like I have myself, I don't know how many, Yvonne, how many eggs or, butter, or caterpillars have you had in at one time? Uh, did you want to, go ahead. 150. And we want, yeah, and about three years ago, our grandson found 38 fully grown caterpillars on our tropical milkweed. So we, we did bring them in and um, just so that they, they would live. And all of them survived, I think, except one. So we mm. had policies hanging off every ornament <laughs> <laughs> and the, we, we've had an enormous success rate with bringing them in. Yeah, the, the tropical milkweed, I was a bit hesitant at first because I've got a thing about only growing native stuff, but they don't survive the winter. So I don't think they'll, I hope not anyway, maybe someone knows more than I do, but I love that tropical milkweed. And actually all the plants we had, you'd given us, Margaret. So I hope, oh. you're, growing, I hope you're growing lots again. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, the tropical milkweed tends to reseed itself if you leave it in the garden. Um, Cause it's just like the regular milkweed, it, it, it bursts and blows out all these little seeds on, on uh, parachutes. But also the tropical milkweed, it's a lot easier to pick an egg because the leaves are much smaller. Yes, exactly. I plant tropical milkweed in pots because I don't have a lot of sun in my backyard. So I put the pots at the side of my house near the garage, near the brick wall, and they do really well. And I've found yeah. lots of eggs there and lots of caterpillars as well. And they're so pretty. The flowers on them they're are so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. If anybody wants to uh, start raising monarchs, please feel free to uh, call me. I'll get you started. I'll, um, you know, it's like, uh, it's so easy to do. You only, it takes five minutes. If, unless you've got 150 like Yvonne and David. It's, uh, <laughs> it takes five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night. And then you just watch them. I also wanted to mention that we're very hopeful. We do maintain um, two pollinator gardens, one in Oakville, one is um, in front of Glen Abbey Community Center. Okay. The other one is at Oak Park. Um, and we rely entirely on volunteers for the uh, spring, summer, fall maintenance. There is not a lot of maintenance, but they're still, especially the one at Oak Park is still establishing. So we're hoping that not immediately, but later on in the spring, that we will have some volunteer opportunities uh, for some light gardening. So basically, it, it, it's a great experience. It's uh, just, um, we'll do it in a safe, uh, mm -hmm. distanced uh, way. And uh, just for some weeding and some learning, we do have a lot of milkweed there. So it will be definitely an opportunity to uh, meet some hopefully some some monarch butterflies as well <laughs> okay oh sorry go ahead i was just going to say that maria um has her hand up so do you have a question maria yes can you hear me yeah yeah okay thank you so much este i would like to ask margaret is if it's better to raise them the milkweed from seed is seed good to raise milkweed or do you prefer like an established plant, what would you recommend? I'd recommend both. Uh, yes. it, yeah, it, uh, if you get a, an established plant, of course you're gonna have milkweed uh, 
ready in June, but I have seen um, butterflies trying to lay eggs on milkweed that has come up from seed in August. And the, the, pl the plant is about this big. And uh, a monarch butterfly, I'm not kidding you, if, if a milkweed leaf was this big, um, a monarch caterpillar, when it's big, could eat this in one day. So you need, if you're gonna raise monarchs, like I live in a basement apartment, so I know about four or five areas in Oakville that I can go and get the common milkweed leaves because the swamp milkweed leaves are about this big. They're, they're long and narrow. And if it's got to eat this much, then it's you're just going to use all the leaves on your plant. So um, it's best to know where there's some milkweed around town so that you're not defoliating your own plants. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. I just wanted to mention, although I think it's over for this year, but we do run a native plant sale um, at Oakville Green every spring. Um, and milkweed is always uh, on the list. Um, so maybe for next spring, just keep an eye um, and get in contact with us. Uh, if you would prefer just to uh, plant more established plants, uh, you can still experiment with, with seeds and um, um, but but if you would like to purchase some um, locally sourced milkweed uh, Ontario native plants, you can uh, you can contact us early next spring. Um, also, um, for there is I know we were run we ran a different workshop about winter sowing, but we can do it again later in the fall if if there is an interest of how to actually start the seeds to so we can. Um, you know, stratify them before before they're mm -hmm. ready to germinate in in the spring. So um, so called winter sowing, which is also a lot of fun. So we can do that as well. Yeah. Um, almost twelve o'clock. Um, this has been wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and, and special thanks to Margaret uh, for her enthusiasm and her, for sharing her knowledge and her expertise with us. Um, if you